to be here and to see everyone. We're going to stand and sing our first song, which is called Saved My Soul. Let's stand and sing. Here we go. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with this song. It's City of Light. We do lots of City of Light songs. If you're familiar, sing along. If not, see if you pick it up. Please be seated. I'd like to welcome you to the service this morning. It's good to see you. And um, if you're new, welcome. Uh, if you've been here for many years, keep rejoicing. One of the uh, tasks of a uh, service leader is to introduce some scripture, uh, either what's on the the printed sheet or a couple of other verses and I want to pick a couple of two verses this morning from Isaiah 49. Um, Chris Boyce is going to be speaking from verse 8 onwards a bit later and here are two verses in Isaiah 49. I'm going to read verse 3 and verse 6. <clears throat> and he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Now, Jesus himself is the ideal Israel, and he 
glorify his father and we are to glorify him as well. And then in verse 6, he says, Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel? I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And our task as believers in the Lord Jesus is to reflect his light so that others can get to know the God who loved us and saved us, as we just sang about. I hope you enjoy the the rest of the service today as we concentrate um, in the book of Isaiah. Let's say the prayer of preparation together. It's on the screen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your holy spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through christ our lord amen and our prayer for today is there as well O lord Tireless guardian of your people, teach us to rely day and night on your care. Drive us to seek your justice and your help, and support our prayer, lest we grow weary. For in you alone is our strength. We make our prayer through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all. <laughs> Welcome back to a few who have been away. Um, first, we don't have any birthdays this week. We have a lot coming up next week, but none this week. Uh, today, we have our prayer meeting on after church. So, if you're able to stay around for that and join us in praying for uh, our church and for the wider community, that would be really great. Uh, on Wednesday, we have midweek communion. Uh, Tuesday, sorry, Tuesday. <laughs> um, Tuesday, we will have midweek communion. There won't be a cafe catch up on Wednesday. I think we're going to be alternating those. So the week that uh, Ladies Fellowship is Ladies Fellowship or midweek communion is on, that will be what's on that week. And the al- uh, alternate weeks is when we'll do cafe catch up. Uh, and this week, it's the third Thursday of the month, so Minute Maccas will be on on Thursday morning, 6 a.m., Upper Mount Gravatt McDonald's. And then on the 30th, uh, which is two Sundays' time, uh, there's the training uh, in using the sound desk, a live stream and pro presenter. So we're still looking for a few brave people who are keen to learn to do that. Um, Ross tells me that it's actually pretty easy. Um, so... It, we just need people who are willing to, to learn it and to do it. We'll have some step-by-step instructions, so uh, please be considering whether you might be available. You don't have to do it every week. We just need people who can be on that roster uh, every now and again. Then our external conferences that are coming up. Um, is, is it too late to register for this one, Chris? Yeah, okay. So if you haven't registered yet for the Women's Convention, you've missed it. Um, I'll take that one out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Seniors get away. It's not too late. It's the middle of November. Uh, so if you're um, around and would like to join with other seniors for that weekend, that would be a great one as well. And then CMS Summer School is back on and it's time to start planning whether you're going to come and camp with a few of us for the week uh, or whether you're going to try and do day trips. So please be joining us for Summer School. Uh, yeah, 6th to the 11th. I couldn't remember the dates. I think that's everything and the kids are about to go out for Sunday school because there's Sunday school on this morning. Yeah, Sunday school's on today. Yep. Thanks, Terry. Gwen is going to bring us the reading from God's Word. This morning we're reading from Isaiah 49, starting at verse 8, just following on as Terry spoke earlier. 
Thus said the Lord, In a time of favour I have answered you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. So establish the land to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, Come out to those in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways, on all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, nor scorching wind nor sun shall strike them, for he who has pity on them will lead them, and springs of water will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and the west, and these from the land of Syene. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget. Yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste go out from you. Lift up your eyes around and see. They all gather, come to you. As I live, declared the Lord, you shall put them all on as an ornament. You shall bind them on as a bride does. Surely your waste and your desolate places and your devastated land, surely now you will be too narrow for your inhabitants and those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children of your bereavement will yet say in your ears, this place is too narrow for me. Make room for me to dwell in. They will say in your heart, who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. But who has brought these? Behold, I was left alone. From where have these come? Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the people and they shall bring your sons in their bosom and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers and queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust at your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Can the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives from a tyrant be rescued? For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken and the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you and I will save your children. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh and drink their own blood as with wine. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Saviour, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce, with which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no answer? Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke I dry up the sea, I make the rivers a desert, their fish stink for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with black, blackness and make sackcloth their covering. Here endeth the lesson. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Gwen. Just before uh, we say the creed together, just one addition to the notices. Um, with the uh, Women's Convention two weekends away, uh, you can register by this Friday as a day visitor. So, ladies, if you'd like to come up, uh, just check with Chris later, and there's forms at the back that give you the details would be good. Let's stand and say our creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Morning, everybody. I hope uh, flashing lights and so on don't put you off too much. I'm reminded of a couple who had an old car and they called it Faith Without Works. <laughs> don't know why I'm reminded about that, but I am. Let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will open your word to us. Pray that you make it plain and clear. Pray that you will glorify the Lord Jesus through your word. And we ask, Lord, that you take all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, by way of introduction, I want to tell you a little anecdote, whether it's true or not, I don't know. It's about a little boy who was taken to church for the first time in his life. And he was with his dad, and they were in church. And as they stood up, he asked his dad, what does this mean? And his dad said, well, we st are standing to sing. That's what we do in church. Oh, okay. Later, they were kneeling, and again he asked, what does that mean? Well, his dad said, we kneel before God when we come to pray. Then when the preacher got up and mounted the pulpit, he took his watch off and put it on the top, on, on the lectern like that. And the little boy said, what does that mean? And his dad said, absolutely nothing at all. <laughs> We've come to a point in Isaiah where God is revealing the Old Testament covenant which is loaded with meaning. It's not nothing at all. It means a whole iceberg of truth. But especially... We're going to think about the part of that, the revealed bit, his unconditional, wholehearted, and continual love for his people. As I'm fond of reminding us all, the Hebrew word chesed uh, describes this sort of steadfast, unfailing, permanent, unchanging, covenant love that God has for his people. Now, this love is not temporary. It's not based on feelings. And we as his people, are completely and perfectly loved by God. So, just take that on board. We, as his people, are perfectly loved by God. And it's expressed as favor. And its destiny is our salvation. Verse 8 says, Thus says the Lord, In a time of favor I have answered you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. This favor, or another word for it, grace, was demonstrated by his free and unconditional love. And Deuteronomy 7 really has it full impact. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. 
So God gave his people a, a gift, a special gift, a way that would make his people distinctive and different from the surrounding nations. And that gift was his law. And the keeping of the law was to be an expression of faith and obedience to God, a way of reflecting back the love that God poured onto them. But as we know, God's people failed to keep it, and their disloyalty and rebellion had a disastrous effects, disastrous results, culminating in the form of, fall of Jerusalem in 587 B.C. But here's the thing. God's prophets repeatedly pointed out that God had every right to terminate the covenant, and yet instead of doing that, God promised restoration, renewal, revival. In a time of favor, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. I'll keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritage, saying to the prisoners, come out, and to those who are in darkness, appear. Nicky Gumbel tells the story of how he was approached by one of his friends, Alex Buchanan, um, a Christian leader who had experienced much suffering, both in his own life, he had a stroke, one side of his face was paralyzed, and his wife was wheelchair-bound with multiple sclerosis. And yet God used this couple so much in encouraging people, assuring them of God's unconditional and continual love for them. And they also sh were very fond of saying to people who were serving the Lord of God's approval for them. And one day, uh, Alex asked Nikki, he said, uh, do you believe that God approves of you? And Nikki replied, well, I'm so conscious of all my own weaknesses. And Alex replied, well, we all are. God wants you to know he loves you and he approves of you. The passage that follows ours is all about God's compassion. Verse 10, verse 13, verse 15. And even in their exile, they can shout for joy. And Isaiah paints five visual aids to show the love of God. So the first one, first visual aid, is that of a shepherd. They shall feed along the way, on all bare, heart, uh, all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind or sun shall strike them, for he who has pity on them will lead them, uh, and by, by springs of water will guide them, and I'll make all my mountains a road, and my highway shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Syene, shout, uh, sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. Now, no way are we going to have time to unpack all of that, but this visual aid of a shepherd who keeps his flock for wool rather than for roast lamb, the shepherd knows his sheep um, over years, and he knows them by name. And, of course, John 10 immediately springs to mind. He knows you just as intimately. And the shepherd provides a picture for his sheep feeding along the way as they follow their shepherd, um, even on seemingly barren hills. They have pasture, and he provides water, and he protects them from the blistering heat and the scorching winds. So this is a wonderful prophecy of our good shepherd, the Lord Jesus of, of John 10, and this should take away much anxiety. Just like our good shepherd, there is the promise of guidance, the promise of direction, for he who has pity on them will lead them by springs of water, will guide them. The shepherds of Bible times walked in front of their flock, uh, uh, and the sheep followed. So uh, he calls them out by name, uh, and, and, and they follow him. So, Fred, Myrtle, Jack, come on, off we go. There was that kind of intimate uh, knowledge of the sheep. And as they walked in front of the sheep, they could see that the path was safe or not. Psalm 23 springs to mind. God, as the shepherd of Israel, will lead his people back out of exile, and in his love he will make even obstacles serve his purpose. 
I'll make all my mountains a road, and my highway shall be raised up. The mountains are his, and he can do what he likes with them. He is God Almighty. He can even flatten them. Um, perhaps this should remind us a bit uh, or get comfort from how everything, even obstacles, even things going wrong, even seeming disasters, God can flatten them out in a sense. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So even when life seems to put up barriers against us, we might discover that they're part of God's plan for us. So as we mourn the halving of our church family, we look to God to work this for good, for there to be double blessing, blessing on both churches. Before we leave this visual aid, I just want to look again at Jesus' fulfillment of it in John 10. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He goes before them. The sheep follow him. For they know his voice. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I know my own and my own know me. But as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay my life, I lay down my life for the sheep. Just a quick look here as to why our good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The sheep represent his people, and we, his people, have rebelled and turned our backs on God. We chose self rule rather than God rule, and so chose his wrath and his judgment, his rightful wrath. And the amazing thing about grace is that Jesus took the full punishment of all that wrath. He took the punishment for our sin on himself, and he laid his life down to pay the price for our sin. So that's the first visual aid, the good shepherd. The next one, the loving parent. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child? that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb. Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. So the battered and fearful people of God, anticipating the destruction from their surrounding superpowers, raise a complaint. God is not going to restore his people. The northern kingdom has already been deported. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. The prophet counters with a question. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast, that's the NIV version, and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. Following Peter's good example, we must have a movie reference. So the movie Philomena is apparently 90% true. I'm not sure how they measure how true thing is and how much they make up. But anyway, it illustrates the strength of a mother's love for her child. So if you've not seen it, the movie plot line is uh, of this lady called Philomena, and it's the, the real-life London-based journalist Martin Sixsmith, Sixsmith, who has lost his job as, as a government advisor. And he's approached at a party by the daughter of Philomena, Philomena Lee, and she suggests that he write a story about her mother who has been forced to give up her toddler son, Anthony, nearly 50 years ago. And Six Misses, he says, no, I don't do human interest stories, but he meets Philomena and decides to investigate her case. And so the search starts to try and trace what happened to her son who was uh, given away to adoptive parents, forced away from his mother, uh, um, uh, and the tragedy or the poignancy of the movie comes when in tra tracing her son, he has been dead for eight years. Now, even if the tragedy of separated mothers and children haunts us, the indelible love of mothers for their babies illustrates God's love for his people, his children. It comes over very powerfully in the movie. She never, ever forgets her little son, Anthony. The Spirit himself 
testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. It's always so comforting to know you're awake. The third visual aid, the visual aid of God's love, the engraver. Behold, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders make haste. Your destroyer and those who laid you waste go out from you. Lift up your eyes around and see. They all gather. They come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you shall put them all on as an ornament. You shall bind them on as a bride does. The engraver. Tattoos are very... um, fashionable at the moment. They're very popular. And many are very intricate and uh, amazing designs. As you walk around the shopping center, you see people's legs decorated with all sorts of incredible tattoos. But other tattoos uh, uh, go back to an earlier time. They're reminders of the one they love, you know, the classic thing of a heart with an arrow through it and uh, the name of the loved one and so on. But the point Isaiah is making here is the permanence of a tattoo. And note, as we do, where the tattoo is positioned, on the palms of God's hands. And our minds go straight to the cross with a hammer and nails, engraving the torture of crucifixion into the hands of the Savior. This graphic description of this is um, in Psalm 22. They've pierced my hands and my feet. Or we might think of Thomas seeing Jesus' palms and, uh, and falling to his knees and saying, my Lord and my God. The evidence for God's ongoing commitment to his people will be seen in a dramatic and spectacular restoration. Your walls are continually before me. The promise extends to the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the repopulation of the land in verses 19 to 21. The children of your bereavement will yet say in your ears, the place is too narrow for me. Make room for, one, for, for me to dwell in. And then you will say in your heart, who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. But who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. From where have these come? People are going to say, where on earth did all these people come from? The place will seem too small for them, verse 20. Even kings and queens will come on that day, verse 23. So if this is what revival looks like in the Old Testament, how mind-blowing will will it be this side of the New Testament? Now, this challenged me. Do we even dare to pray for this kind of revival revival? in our church, in our suburb, in our city, and out to the world. Do we even want it? Over 120 years ago, revival came to Melbourne. 10,000 a night at the Royal Exhibition Building in May 1902. In 1898, a petition with 15,300 signatures was sent to D.L. Moody in the USA asking him to come and lead a crusade. He died before he could come, but in 1902, R.A. Torrey came and led a crusade at the exhibition building. Now, with a population at the time of Melbourne of 500,000, over 250,000 people came every week. Now, the secret, according to Stuart Pigeon, all the evangelical churches in Melbourne were working together And they held 1,700 weekly prayer groups across Melbourne. They appointed 45 evangelists to preach in every area of the city, so wrote Stuart Pigeon. It's in a a book, I think it's called The Vital Elements, Unity in Prayer from Evangelical Christianity in Australia. The fourth visual aid of love is the conqueror. Can the prey be taken from the mighty? Or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. 
Isaiah's hearers are skeptical. Their eyes are not on their great God. Their eyes are on the might of Babylon and not on Almighty God. Is God capable of such a rescue, they ask? And the prophet replies, God's love is like a conqueror. Verse 25 and 26. He is more than able to carry out his rescue, his salvation, his snatching of the sinner from the jaws of death. The fifth visual aid of love is that of a husband. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I've sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no one to answer? Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke I dry up the sea, I make the rivers a desert, their fish stink for lack of water and die from thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. So the first objection raised by God's people was that God would not do it. And then the second uh, objection they raised is that he could not do it. And now this third uh, rejection is that he should not do it. They're saying that God has divorced them because of their sins, and they felt sold to the creditors because of their iniquities. And the reply that God gives to Isaiah is that it is indeed their sins, their idolatry, their shameful treatment of the poor that caused their exile, but God is able to restore them. He's not divorced them or sold them into slavery. He asks, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Of which of my creditors is to whom I have sold you. Lynn and I were once involved with a, an open-air campaigner called Peter Partington. Uh, when we lived in Merseyside, we were doing street evangelism in Wallasey. Now, apparently, uh, that's the Birkenhead side of, uh, uh, of the River Mersey, and apparently that's the posh side, but uh, believe me, it was nothing posh about Wallasey. And we were doing street evangelism there, and Peter... Partington, I don't know if you're familiar with open-air campaigners, they often have this storyboard, you know, uh, and they make letters appear and do little stick men and so on, and he was joking about how he was Leonardo da Vinci, and uh, as he was making his way through all the jokes, he was weaving in the gospel and how to be saved. And towards the end of his talk, a woman uh, cried out from, from the gathering around us, I couldn't possibly come anywhere near Jesus. You don't know what I have done. And as quick as a flash, Peter said, Madam, you've just taken the first step towards Jesus. No one is too far out of God's reach. Taking a step of repentance, a step towards faith, the belong, be believe, become journey, uh, uh, and we find then that God is married to his people. In the Bible, God's love for his people is often likened to husband's life for his wife. For your maker is your husband, says verse 5 of chapter 54. Through the prophets Ezekiel and Malachi, God accuses his people of being an adulterous wife. You prefer strangers to your own husband, Ezekiel 16. And Paul speaks of marriage and a husband's love for his wife as an, an analogy of Christ's love for his church in Ephesians 5. And finally, in Revelation, the church is described as the bride of Christ. The scriptures are unashamed, intimate, an intimate relationship describing the relationship between Christ and his church and an intimacy which we, his children, can experience. Now, here's a, a quote from a letter. Um, many years ago, we used to run what we called Agnostics Anonymous groups. And in our Agnostics Anonymous groups, we'd take a, a, a small group of, of willing seekers um, to uh, work our way through Mark's gospel and just ask, to ask two questions. Who is Jesus? And the second question, so what? 
there was uh, a, a young man on one of our Agnostics Anonymous groups, and he was vociferously a against the veracity of the gospel and the Christian truth, and, and he was there to stir up trouble, you know. And his wife said, Charlie will never become a Christian. And um, I was driving um, back to Eastbourne, where we lived one day, and we were very modern. We had car phones in our car, and the phone rang, and it was Charlie's wife. And she was telling me he'd just become a Christian. Well, there was very nearly a road traffic accident. I did take both hands off the wheel for a short while to say, Hallelujah! Oh, I'm driving. He wrote to me, and here's a bit of his letter. At the moment of my rebirth, what I experienced was a total overwhelming love. I simply cannot describe the adequately in words, but if anyone has experienced anything utterly shattering, they may be able to have some appreciation of my utter helplessness, wonder, astonishment, etc. If I could but describe a part of the wonderful love that I have come to know and feel, and I believe is still glowing within me, at times my heart feels like bursting with it. Charlie's discovery of the love of Jesus that he had for him. Can we bow our heads and pray, ladies and gentlemen? Lord Jesus, you are our shepherd, our good shepherd, and we are so thankful that you've laid down your life for us. Thank you that you are our Father, our heavenly Abba, Father. Thank you that we are engraved on the palms of your hand, engraved with the nails that brought us salvation. Thank you that you are the conqueror. Nothing is too difficult for you. Thank you that we, your church, we are your bride and we can delight in your presence. Amen. Well, having heard about God's great love for us, it's only right that we should stand and sing How Great Thou Art. So would you stand and sing with us? Stop. 
take a seat. Um, in my personal Bible reading lately, I've been reading through the book of Amos, and while reading chapter 4, I was struck by God's reminder to Israel of just who their God is, as he says, He who forms the mountains, who creates the wind, and who reveals his thoughts to mankind, who turns dawn to darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. So let's pray to our Lord God Almighty. With our whole hearts, we praise you, God. You are the Messiah, the soon and coming King. You are our peace, our protector, and the high priest who became our redeemer and sacrifice forever. You died to set us free. You rose again and gave us victory over death. We were enslaved in sin, but you are our salvation, our rescuer, and our refuge. You give us hope. Your love for us is unconditional and wholehearted, even though it is wholly undeserved. And so, knowing your love for us and your promises to us, we call out to you in prayer. In your compassion, Father, comfort and heal those who are in trouble, sorrow, need or sickness. We pray for those we love who are in need of your unfailing love and mercy. Thank you that you are always working in your loving power for the good of those who love you, that we may become mature in Christ and bring glory to your name. Open your eyes. Open our eyes to see your will and help us to hear your word with reverent and obedient hearts so that regardless of our circumstances, we may praise and serve you in joy and truth every day of our lives. We come before you now with humble hearts, praying for your sovereign hand to be at work in our world. We pray for all those who are serving you around our world. We pray you would give them strength and encouragement as they seek to tell others about you in a cross-cultural context. We pray for your worldwide church. We thank you that so many people all over this earth have come to know you and love you. We think of Ukraine, China, Russia, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, and all other countries suffering from strife and war. Please strengthen and uphold your church and your children in this time. Give them boldness of faith to cling to you through conflict and fear. We pray especially for our link missionaries particularly Rachel in Eurasia and Nathan and Diane in South Africa. We also pray for Sid and Sylvia and all others we know who you have sent to share the gospel cross-culturally. We pray you would give them encouragement, boldness and endurance as they share the goodness of your gospel with others. We pray you would be opening hearts of those they talk, and talk to and interact with so that they may come to know the joy, hope and salvation found in Jesus. And Father, we pray that those of us here in Australia would be encouraged by their dedication to share the gospel and would be bold to share the gospel with those around us. Father, we mourn for the way that sin has broken our world and our country. We feel frustration and anger when we see the wrongs that our sinful actions have caused. We mourn for the leaders who have chosen to follow their sinful desires instead of seeking justice, mercy and goodness. Father, we praise you for being a God who cares about justice, who commands justice, who upholds justice. We praise you for showing us that you will not let the evil things of this world go unpunished. We thank you that it is your very nature to right the wrongs of the world. And so we pray for our leaders, for all those in positions of power and authority, whether it is in politics, the law, the church, or any other position. We pray for ourselves. Please right the wrongness of sin in us. In your sovereignty, help us to see where we have chosen our way over your way and to return to you with humility and hearts willing to change. Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus. We thank you for his perfect leadership. We thank you that we can trust that he will never fail, that he is the perfect leader, the perfect prophet, the perfect priest and the perfect temple. Through him, we see perfect justice, perfect love and perfect mercy. And Father, make every thought, every action, and every word wholeheartedly obedient to you. Fill our hearts with your truth, so that we may discern your will and glorify you in everything. May our thoughts, words, and deeds be a reflection of that conviction, that personal trust that we have placed in you. In everything, we pray that you would be encouraging us, challenging us, and changing us to be more like Jesus. Amen. Should I have another Lord's Prayer? Yeah.
we'll continue praying in the Lord's Prayer. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Trinity, for sharing with us. We come to a time of confession, and after hearing God's word this morning, and after hearing prayers, the reading from God's word, there's much we need to confess. We come to communion shortly, and we need these words. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat the bread and drink the cup. We are God's children now, and what will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when, we, when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure knowing the goodness of God and our failure to respond with love and obedience let us confess our sins saying together heavenly father you have loved us with an everlasting love but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done we are sorry for our sins and turn away from them for the sake of your son who died for us forgive us cleanse us and change us by your holy spirit enable us to live for you through jesus christ our lord amen god is slow to anger and full of compassion, forgiving all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Saviour and Lord. God therefore forgives you, forgives me, forgives us in Christ Jesus, in whom there is no condemnation. If you believe that, say Amen. amen. A bit louder. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Can we stand, ladies and gentlemen? We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's exchange a sign of peace with one another, and when the musos think we've had enough of that, they'll start singing the next song. This is a song we have done before. Uh, we did it at the prayer and praise night that we had earlier this year as well. You may not be familiar with it, um, but if you are, please sing along. And it, it's a helpful song to reflect on as we um, continue with our time of communion. Strong to wake us at 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, making us in your own image. We praise you for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and raising to new life, offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore we lift our voices to praise you, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And now, gracious God, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine and pray that we who receive them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit according to our Savior's word in remembrance of his suffering and death may share his body and blood. On the night before he died Jesus took bread and when he, uh, uh, he took bread and when he had given you thanks 
He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We who are many are one body in Christ, for we all share in one bread. After supper, he took the cup. And again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We eat this bread and drink this cup to proclaim the death of the Lord. We do this until he returns. Come, Lord Jesus. Father, as we recall his saving death and glorious resurrection, may we who share these gifts be renewed by your Holy Spirit and united in the body of your Son. Bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, there to feast at your table and join in your eternal praise. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Please follow the instructions which are going to be on your screen as we come forward to receive the bread and the wine and we all eat and drink together. So do...
Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Gracious God, thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for assuring us of your goodness and love and that we are living members of Christ's body. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Send us out from the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Our final song is, Christ is mine forevermore. Can we stand and sing?
Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and all those you love. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of Christ.